need to know um, for any type of garden that you want to have, whether you want to add flowers to your garden this year, whether you want to plant a tree, or whether you'd like to grow edibles, we're going to get you started and get you ready for everything we think you need to know to get ready to grow. And so our objectives tonight, we're going to start with preparing yourself uh, getting yourself ready, getting your tool shed ready. We're going to cover all of these topics uh, all the way to where do you go for help. At the end of the presentation, uh, we'll provide some websites and some useful um, uh, uh, resources where you could go for help. Uh, in addition to introducing you to our Cornell Cooperative Extension Oneida County website. Um, and we hope tonight that there's something in this presentation, whether you're a beginner, whether you're an intermediate gardener, or whether you're an experienced gardener. Hopefully, there'll be something tonight that you'll be able to take away and use in your own gardens. So first of all, just like any type of job, any type of hobby that you want to take on, you need to have the proper tools. It's not any different for gardening. Um, this is just a typical list of what you might want to have in your tool shed. And in fact, with the weather the way it is, it's still a little early to get out there and garden. Now is a good time to look through your tools. Um, I like to point out a couple of my favorite things to have around. Uh, five gallon buckets to me um, are, are worth their weight in gold. You could do a lot of different things with a five gallon bucket. Having more than one is really a great thing. You want to try to have a good weeding tool. I use, if I can get my mouse to work here, there we go. I like the cobra head weeders. Um, I have both a stand-up one and a hand one, but there are a lot of different types of weeders out there, but having a good weeder is an important tool. And then I think the most important thing in your tool shed is having uh, a round tip shovel, a flat shovel, and a fork. Uh, your round shovel is good for digging, transplanting. Your flat shovel is an excellent tool uh, for edging. But take a look at your tool shed now and make sure that you have all of these things. And one of the things you want to remember is you don't, you really don't need a lot of money uh, to have good tools, but buy the best quality that you can afford. The most important thing to remember is to keep those tools clean and sharp. And you might wonder why is it important to keep them clean? I'm gonna be out in the garden, they're probably gonna get dirty anyway. Well, one thing that, that people don't realize is if you handle a diseased plant, especially with clippers or pruners, those disease spores or that bacteria can actually reside on your tools. So you wanna keep your, you wanna start out with clean tools, you wanna to start out with sharp tools, and then during the garden season, from time to time as you use your tools, take a minute to sanitize them. And you can do that one of two ways. Uh, rubbing alcohol makes a great uh, way to keep your tools clean. After you finish them, wipe them down with rubbing alcohol. If you don't have rubbing alcohol, you can use a bleach and water solution. I like to use a one part bleach to a nine part water solution and just wash them off. And then make them hard to lose. I wish I had a quarter for every trowel that I've probably misplaced because they get lost in the garden or they get lost in the woods. Uh, put a bright pit, uh, ribbon on them or paint the handle, make them hard to lose, mark them somehow so you can find them, and then make sure you store them indoors, store them properly. And then these are some other items you want, might want to consider to have in your tool shed. Uh, one of the things that I think people forget about having is hand cleaner. Um, how many times have I, you know, needed to go to a luncheon or something after I've been gardening? And if you don't have a good hand cleaner, people are going to know you're a gardener when you go to lunch. Um, so take a look at this list. 
once your tools are prepared, you want to be safe. Um, you should always think safety when you do anything, and there's that applies to gardening as well. Uh, you want to dress to protect. Uh, you want to wear long pants, long sleeves, uh, uh, boots, or preferably a hat. Uh, don't forget your sun protection. Don't forget some kind of insect repellents. And one of the things that I like to recommend uh, having a family member that has Lyme disease is do a tick check after you're done gardening. Believe it or not, ticks can be active as long as the temperature is 32 degrees. So it doesn't have to be the peak of summer for ticks to be active. And you don't need to be in a woodland environment for the ticks to be active. They can be present in any type of garden environment. So when you're done gardening, check yourself over, check your children over. If, you're doing, if your children are gardening with you, take the time to do a tick check. Know your physical limitations. Gardening shouldn't be a marathon. You don't wanna do it all at once and get yourself hurt. So know your limitations, take breaks, stay hydrated, use the right tool for the right purpose. Gardening isn't a place where you wanna take a shortcut. And consider practice, practicing ergonomic gardening. Um, ergonomics is actually, it looks at how do you do a task in the safest way and the most efficient way. Um, ergonomic tools are designed so that you use them the way your body naturally uh, reacts, the way you naturally hold things. And so I think it, it's portrayed pretty well in this photograph. Uh, you see the example of a good ergonomic uh, uh, tool and how you're using it versus a poor one. If you'd like more information on uh, some tips on gardening uh, ergonomically, I'd recommend you go to a website that's called ergonomics-info.com and you'll get some great ideas. They'll even show you uh, examples of ergonomic tools and where you can purchase them. So to talk, to start our discussion about the basics of what you need to know uh, for any type of gardening, one of the first things you wanna know about is what zone you're located in. Uh, this is the United States Department of Agriculture Plant Hardiness Zone Map. It was upgraded in 2012. Uh, you could see that the majority of Oneida County is in what they call zone five. You don't need to worry about 5A or 5B. It's the main number that's important. This map is important when it comes to buying uh, trees, shrubs, perennials, any kind of plant material that's gonna come back from year to year because it will tell you when you go to purchase a plant, there'll either be tag or information in there that'll tell you what that plant is zoned for. And so what you don't wanna do is buy a plant that's zoned warmer. You can see the color green show that it's around uh, Lake Ontario and further downstate. Those are warmer areas Here it is. that can grow warmer zoned plants. And so you wanna make sure that you purchase a plant that's good for the zone. Now, personally, when this changed in 2012, I'm not sure if we really are zone five because our winters are just so unpredictable. Um, I like to tell people, you know, you can't go wrong if you pick a zone four plant because you know it'll be hardy enough for this area. But zones are just a guide. Uh, the lower the number, the more cold hardy the plant is. But as I said, they're only a guide. Um, what you find on your property are things called microclimates. And microclimates will allow you to grow plants that are, that are normally in a warmer zone. So to give you a couple examples of microclimates that you'll find on your property, for example, a southern exposure is probably one of the warmest exposures you can have because there's a lot of sunlight and so a southern exposure may be able to grow a warmer zoned plant. 
Another example is up against a building. If you're going to grow a landscape uh, or a garden that's up against your house or up against another building, what happens is heat is reflected off of that building and it makes that area warmer. So you can literally grow a different zoned plant there. And so even though you have the zones as a guide, keep in mind the microclimates that you might have uh, on your property. Now zones mean nothing for plants that only survive a year. So for example, any of your annual flowers like marigolds or most of your vegetables, the zone means nothing. What's important for those plants is when is your last frost in the spring going to hit and when is your first freeze in the fall going to hit and the time frame between those two dates is what you call your growing season and that's important because some vegetables for example are going to take a, a, a lot of days before they'll bear fruit so if our growing season is say 150 days and a plant tag tells you the tomato is going to take 180 days to produce the fruit, you don't want to use that plant. That's why tomatoes that grow, say, in Florida are not a good choice to grow up here because their growing season is longer. And the NOAA Weather Service will produce um, average frost freeze dates, and I just happened to look up Utica today just to kind of give you an idea. So NOAA says that even as late as May 30th, that's their recommendation of when it's the, the best to plant vegetables, because there's still a 32% chance that you could get frost on that day. So the later, in other words, you wanna plant your vegetables later rather than earlier. So don't be in a hurry to plant those annuals. Um, and so that's the scoop on zones that I wanted to discuss. So what are the plant choices that are out there? Well, we all know what annuals are. Those are the ones that, that takes a season to grow and then they die. You're probably familiar with perennials. Perennials are plants that will come back year to year. Uh, you may not be as familiar with, with plants that are classified as biennials. What a biennial is, is it takes two years for the plant to complete its life cycle. So the first year it's producing foliage, the second year it's producing flowers. A couple of examples, hollyhocks, if anyone's ever grown hollyhocks, hollyhocks are classified as biennials. And if anyone's grown a foxglove, that's another example of a biennial. Biennials can be a little tricky to grow um, and they, sometimes they're not as dependable as say a perennial would be. And usually your plant tag will specify if a particular plant is a biennial. And then there are different forms. We're all familiar with potted plants, but you may not be as familiar with a bare root plant. And the center photograph is an example of a bare root and it, it looks like it might be a dead plant, but it's not. A bare root is a plant that's in its dormant stage, and we're gonna talk about that and how to use them later in the presentation. And then there are bulbs. Bulbs is a generic term for plants that store their energy. Instead of a set of roots, they actually store them in an organ called a bulb. It sometimes can be called a tuber, or sometimes they're called corms, but they're all classified as bulbs. And then there's seeds, and we are gonna talk about seeds in a little more detail later in the presentation. So what's out there? I throw this out here because you don't need to have specific places to grow certain things. The newest garden trends take all of these things of what's out there and literally integrate them into the landscape so that you don't need to have one place where there's edibles, one place that there's flowers, mix it up. And in fact, uh, breeders have gone uh, crazy with plants that are grown strictly for their foliage. It used to be all you could find were plants that bloomed. Now foliage is a big deal and it really brings a lot of interest into the garden. When I say grasses, 
the, I, I'm talking about ornamental grasses, not your lawn grass. Ornamental grasses are a really uh, recent trend and they're gaining steam. You'll find a lot more ornamental grasses out there for the gardener. And vegetables and herbs have come a long way. In fact, uh, probably one of the newer trends is what they call edible landscapes, where you put your edible crops and mix them in with your regular plants in the landscape. In fact, a lot of uh, vegetables and herbs, there's so many varieties. For example, sage. There's a multitude of varieties of sage where they take different color foliage. So you not only can use it to cook with, but it looks pretty. So the point is, is mix it up a little bit. And fruits. Fruits are, are really taking off, especially what they call uh, small fruits. For example, on the left of your screen, you'll see a blueberry that's called Top Hat. This is a, a unique and new uh, variety of blueberry. It's designed number one, it doesn't need a pollinator so that it can produce fruit without having a mate. And the other thing is you'll notice it's small, compact, and actually pretty because you can integrate it right into the landscape. It can be a small shrub. On the top right corner is a new introduction of raspberries. They're a whole uh, variety series called brazzleberries and they're designed for small spaces. You can even plant them in containers. And if you're interested in learning more about growing small fruits and vegetables, we are going to have another Zoom uh, uh, class on May 6th at 7 p.m. Uh, we're gonna talk about small fruits such as strawberries, blueberries, and raspberries, and how to uh, grow vegetables. And don't forget the bulbs and tubers that are out there, many vegetables, like a potato is actually classified as a tuber. Um, we're familiar with, with uh, bulbs such as daffodils and tulips, but don't, don't forget about uh, your, your lily bulbs. I'm just gonna charge my laptop for a second. Sorry about that. And don't forget, there are roses, vines, shrubs, and trees. Uh, that little montage of roses at the top photograph, those are knockouts. Uh, Knockout is gonna be celebrating their 20 years of uh, since they introduced that rose variety. So I suspect you'll be seeing a lot of different knockout roses um, at your nurseries. The point is, is mix it up. There's a lot out there to choose from. So when you're getting started for the first time on wanting to start a garden, you wanna start out with a plan. And you wanna ask yourself some questions. For example, what do I wanna accomplish? Do I wanna have flowers? Do I wanna grow vegetables? Um, probably the biggest question you wanna ask yourself is how much maintenance do I wanna take on? Um, know your maintenance threshold. So for example, expect that a vegetable garden is going to take a little more time to maintain than say a perennial garden or for example shrubs. So you want to start slow, ask yourself those questions, take some pictures, uh, create a budget, know how much money that you'd like to spend, uh, we're gonna talk about some ways you can use less costly alternatives because potted plants are expensive. Uh, so we're gonna talk about the use of bare root and seeds um, as another way to uh, bring your budget down. And then take a look at spaces where there's an you can have an asset and develop that asset. So for example, when you look at this photograph, I consider personally a narrow space to be an asset because you don't need um, a lot of room to have a garden and it's not gonna be as maintenance heavy. It'll be a little bit easier for you to maintain. And in this case, even if your soil is not a quality soil, you can always create a raised bed. Uh, so take a look at, at your area. Shade, for example, is another example, another 
uh, example of uh, an area that can be an asset. You can grow a stunning garden in the shade. There are a lot of uh, really interesting shrubs, trees, and plants that'll grow well in shade. So once you have a plan, it's all about location uh, and where you're going to place uh, a new garden bed. And this is a good time to look around. It's still early to plant, but it's a good time to kind of take a look at your landscape and decide where would you like to put a garden. And the first thing you want to do is look at, take a look at your existing soil. Um, heavy, the two extremes, heavy clay or sand, are probably not your best uh, options of soil. So you may have to consider adding amendments to your soil, which we're going to talk about in a second. Uh, now's a good time to take a look at drainage. Do you have wet spots on your property? If you do, that's probably not the best place to put a garden. Look at what's growing there now. If it's not growing well now, chances are you, you put a garden there of something else, it's not gonna grow well either. Um, and look at other site considerations. For example, a slope. Always remember that drainage is rainwater, drainage, it's going to go down that slope. So if you plant something at the bottom of a hill or the bottom of a, of a sloped area, you're going to have excess water that may not be the best place. And then obviously you wanna plan ahead. Typically, it may take you a couple garden seasons before you have your optimal garden location. Uh, but don't be in a hurry. Now's a good time to start your plan. So how do you start? How do you develop the actual site? Well, you wanna, the best option is to remove the existing sod that's there and try to work in some good quality topsoil and till that together and consider adding amendments. What I mean by amendments is usually compost, but there's other organic matter that you can add to your soil. Um, we're gonna talk about the benefits of compost in a second. And when you're starting a, bed for the, a garden bed for the first time, a complete soil test is really a good idea. Probably the most important test you can do is to check the soil pH, which I'll talk about in a second. But I can't, stress enough the importance of starting with good soil. If you really want to have success in whatever garden endeavor you're going to take on, start with a good foundation and that means starting out with a good soil. There is a shortcut that you could take because I realize that it's a lot of work. If you're going to start a, a garden bed from scratch and you've got to cut that sod and, and and lift it away, that is heavy work. You could consider this shortcut, what I kind of call the newspaper cardboard approach. And what it entails is you can take anywhere from six to 10 layers of newspaper. Don't use the colored inserts, the black and white, or you can use two to three layers of cardboard. Either one will work. Placing that on top of the sod wetting it down, and then putting your topsoil compost mix on top of that. What will happen is the newspaper and cardboard will eventually break down. They're actually, newspaper and cardboard is actually a form of organic matter. So that will actually break down and it will kill the existing sod underneath. And it doesn't matter if you do it right onto your uh, garden area or you incorporate it in a raised bed as you can see in the photograph on the right side. Now typically the best thing to do would be to do this in the fall so that the cardboard and newspaper has a chance to break down over the winter months and then you could go ahead and plant but there's nothing that says you can't do this now. You would literally have to poke a hole in the newspaper or cardboard to put your plants in there. Um, that may introduce weeds because you're not completely killing the sod underneath, but it is doable. I've done this several times and I can tell you from experience, it takes a lot of the bulk work away from uh, creating that bed from scratch. So I, I, I would, uh, well, you know, offer it in consideration. 
I can't emphasize the importance of healthy soil and adding compost is going to be your best option with organic matter. What compost does is it, 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 in, it makes your soil healthy. It introduces beneficial bacteria that can kill bad bacteria in the soil. It introduces microscopic organisms into the soil so that it actually helps to create healthy oh, yeah. plants. We won't spend a lot of time on compost tonight because we welcome you. Yeah, yeah. We will have a, a composting huh? session on Wednesday. We'll talk about the fact that you don't need a big space. You can compost on a small scale as well as a large scale. But it is good for your soil. It's probably the best amendment and the best thing you could do for your soil. So soil testing along with amendments, um, you can do, a, as I mentioned, you could do a complete uh, soil analysis, which will study the soil and give you a complete nutrient analysis, or you could test for what's called pH. And pH is a, is a measure of the soil's ability to absorb nutrients. Why is it important? If your pH is off, you can fertilize as much as you want. If the pH is off, the plants can't do anything with it. They can't absorb it. And so you're probably familiar with terms like acidic, Acidic soil means your pH is too low. Alkaline soil means your soil, your, your, your pH is too high and either extreme, um, you may have to add amendments to your soil. You really don't want to add things like lime to a soil without having a soil test. Um, unfortunately, due to the fact that uh, the Cornell Cooperative Extension at Oneida County is, is closed under the current environment, we can't do the soil testing, otherwise we would be able to do that. What I would advise is that you can go to our website, which will make sure you see our website at the end of the presentation. You'll see guidance on how to take a soil sample. Um, I understand some of the agways will do soil testing. Uh, some of the hardware stores and, and garden center nurseries also can do soil testing. You can also buy your own soil test kit. Um, it's not hard. It's just, you know, it's just a, a, process, a different type of a process. But adding uh, any kind of organic amendment is going to improve your soil quality. Even something as simple as fallen leaves. Leaves will add organic matter, which will help your soil. Grass clippings, if you don't use any kind of weed killer or any kind of chemical to your soil, that will help. Uh, sawdust, wood chips, all of those types of things are considered organic amendments that can help to improve your soil. So one last comment about pH uh, and why it's important. Remember that neutral is good for most plants, but it is important to know that some plants need those extremes. So for example, if you wanna grow blueberries, you need acidic soil. They will not grow if the soil um, is alkaline or neutral. They prefer that extreme. Um, rhododendrons, prefer acidic soil. Evergreens prefer acidic soil. On the other side of the scale, alkaline soil, uh, beet growing beets, for example, uh, they prefer alkaline. If you grow baby's breath or dianthus, they prefer alkaline. So just know most of the time it's neutral, but some plants are going to like those extremes. That's why it's important to have the testing done. Let there be light. All plants need light. Um, some plants just thrive uh, with a lower degree of light, but they're, they all need some form of light. There are different degrees. Uh, what's considered full sun? Full sun is considered six hours of direct sunlight between the hours of 10 and 6 p.m. So anything 
Uh, six hours and above is considered full sun. Your part sun is anything less than six hours. And then complete shade is, it, part sun is actually anywhere from four to six. Complete shade is less than four. And you wanna observe the light at different times. So for example, right now the light is different Springtime light is going to be def different than summertime light because of the angle of the sun in the sky. If you have a lot of trees on your property, the light may, is going to be different when the trees don't have their leaves versus when they're leafed out. So you really want to look at the different parts of the day and the different seasons to determine what you have on your property. Uh, when you look at this photograph, I think this illustrates pretty well degrees of sunlight because you could see it's brighter at the front of the path and then towards the back of the path, but in the center, it's somewhat dark. And so in the center, you're going to need shade loving plants versus at the other end, you could probably get away uh, with plants that will require a little more light. Um, usually a plant that that needs full sun will still grow in the shade, but you may not get any blooms. It doesn't work the other way around. If you put a shade plant in a full sun location, chances are they're going to burn. And so it's really important that you take a look at the degrees of light that you have on your property. Fertilizer, this is another aspect um, about gardening that's important. If you ever go in a plant nursery, the numbers and the types of fertilizer bags can overwhelm you. I mean, you'll see shelves and shelves of fertilizers for any purpose you can imagine. But all fertilizers basically have three things. They'll present you with the amount of nitrogen, the amount of phosphorus and the amount of potassium that's contained in the bag. And those are, that is given by numbers. So when you take a look at the sample of a bag on the bottom, you'll see 533. Three. Those numbers correspond to the parts nitrogen, the parts phosphorus, and the parts potassium, NPK, that are in that bag. And what those three elements do is spelled out on this chart. So in this particular uh, bag sample, this is high in nitrogen. Chances are it's pretty good for say lawn uh, grass because most of your lawn fertilizers will have a high nitrogen number at the expense of the other two. A blooming type fertilizer will have a strong or higher middle number because the phosphorus promotes flower growth and fruits and seed production. Normally you wanna look for, I mean, you could get a fertilizer for just about every different plant, but it's really not necessary. What's really best is to take a look at a general purpose fertilizer. Um, and it'll say that right on the bag. Another important part of the bag is the derived from line. That'll tell you whether the fertilizer is an organic fertilizer or a synthetic fertilizer. So when you look at this sample, it says derived from poultry manure. That's the natural source. When the derived from is a natural source, then that's an organic fertilizer. If this were a synthetic example, you would see a chemical name on the derived from line. So why is this important? Do you have to fertilize? Um, I, I wish I had the exact answer, it really depends. Chances are good that you probably will fertilize uh, some of your plants at some point. It's just that not all plants need the same fertilizer all the time. Uh, so for example, vegetables are heavy feeders. So chances are you will have to fertilize at some point. If you use compost, remember that compost fertilizes in the long term. Any kind of regular off the shelf fertilizer only fertilizes for the short term. So it only is good for the season that you apply it versus compost is really for the long term and it's probably your best option. 
Now there are different types of fertilizers out there. We already talked about you can buy an organic fertilizer or a synthetic. You can also buy what's called a slow release or a fast release. Slow release, uh, you'll see the, the photograph in the center of the pellets in, in the person's hand. Slow release is typically in a pellet or granular form. And as the name implies, it feeds the plant slowly. Fast release is usually water soluble. So people are pretty familiar with miracle Grow. That's a fast release uh, fertilizer. Um, typically, when to apply, it's best to apply in the spring. Typically, you want to apply uh, a slow release fertilizer in the spring once your plants have started growing. Typically, when plants are about five to six inches tall, and then you can supplement during the rest of the season with your water-based. You typically want to stop fertilizing as we get into August because at that point, it's really too late um, to use uh, any fertilizers. Using manures can be a little tricky. Uh, you want to make sure the manure is aged. You never want to use cat or dog manure because it can, can contain parasites. And typically, if you're going to use uh, a manure, you want to wait at least a month before you plant. Um, as a Cornell recommendation, they recommend a general purpose, slow release in the spring. And then, as I mentioned, as the, as the uh, plants begin to grow through the, the garden season, then use a water-based uh, um, fertilizer every four to six weeks. Watering is important, but I, I mentioned this as effective and efficient use of watering. This is especially important for us that are paying for our water usage. Um, typically, uh, landscape use can be anywhere from 20 to 50% of your water usage. And so you want to pick the best ways and the most efficient ways to apply the water. That usually amounts to using soaker hoses or drip irrigation versus a sprinkler. If you are going to use a sprinkler, consider putting a timer on it so that you're getting the most efficient use. One of the greatest tricks to try to conserve with water is to use soil moist crystals. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever used that before. They're actually a polymer. I wish we were in person, I could give a demonstration, but what they do is when you apply this with your plantings or you put it in the soil, they literally absorb the water to hold it and release it later. And it makes for a great um, efficient way to keep your plants watered because it literally takes the water you give them and you can use it later. You'll probably see in the market now, there's a lot of soils that actually have the water crystals already incorporated in them. So that's another way for effective watering. Or you can collect rainwater with a rain barrel. That happens to be a photograph of a rain barrel that my brother made for me, just using an over-the-counter uh, Rubbermaid trash can uh, connected to the downspout on my house. And I, I have several of these to collect rainwater. It's another way to uh, conserve water. So the final word on watering is to water wisely. It really is important to understand that when it comes to watering, less is more. When you look at the photograph, what you want to do is deep, what we call deep infrequent watering. So you're not, if you could see the difference in the roots on the picture, when you water deeply but infrequently, the root system is growing very intensely. So you have roots at the top as well as roots at the bottom. This is an example of grass growing under these conditions. You could see that's the optimal thing you want to do. If you water deeply but you're watering all the time, that's the center photograph. The roots are growing at the bottom but the top roots are just not thriving because the soil's too soggy. And then in the third diagram, you see if you water very shallow, you, you know, you're just kind of 
sprinkling the lawn and you're but you're you're watering a lot but you're not watering very deeply what happens is the roots grow at the surface at the expense of the deep roots and the grass is just not going to grow well so really less is more water deeply when you and you don't have to water as often and most important water the roots um, wet plants are just a magnet for diseases. So you don't avoid overhead watering as much as you can because the, the wetter your plants uh, stay, the more prone they are to diseases. And when to water is important. Try to water early in the morning. That's optimally the best time. In the peak of the day, when it's hot, water is gonna evaporate very quickly and you don't wanna water on a windy day. And then if you're not a really dependable waterer, then you may want to consider uh, plants that are more drought tolerant. And a lot of uh, breeders have, plant breeders are, are really getting into plants that can tolerate uh, drought better. Mulch is important. Not only does it look nice, it helps to retain moisture. Your natural materials make for your best mulch and compost or, or shredded leaves are actually your best choice. There's nothing wrong with the other choices, but just understand that they can have some issues. For example, plastic, using plastic as a mulch can actually retain a lot of moisture under conditions like heavy rain. Gravel and stone looks nice, but remember that it'll get really hot in a full sun location. And so you better have plants in there that can handle a soil that's a lot hotter because it'll really almost act like a heat sink. And peat moss is okay, but it can go through extremes. During a drought, it can make the soil really, really dry. Or if you have excessive rain, it can actually retain too much moisture. What you choose is just as important as how you apply it. And so the correct mulching method, you really don't need more than two or three inches deep of mulch and you wanna mulch wide. You wanna avoid what we call mulch volcanoes. When you look at that top photograph, what do you think's gonna happen if it rains? I think it's a, a really good visual. You can see what'll happen. The rain is, water is not gonna go to the roots of that particular plant. It's gonna wash right off that volcano and it's gonna go away from the plant instead of getting to the root zone. And because the mulch is so packed up against the bark, that water is gonna go right down the center and it's gonna cause root rot. And so that's another uh, tip that you wanna keep the mulch about three or four inches away from the crown of the plant and then remember, mulch wide, not deep. Good air circulation is something we tend to forget when we're gardening, and it's important in terms of above the soil and below the soil. Above the soil, you want to space your plants out. The more crowded your plants are, the less air that can circulate around them, and that's going to invite a disease issue, especially when the humidity starts to arrive or if we get a very wet spell. If those plants can't get air, that's what's gonna cause diseases. So that's above the soil. Below the soil, you wanna avoid what's called soil compaction. Try to avoid walking right on your garden beds. Instead, take a look at this photograph. If you can use, using this board, equally distributes your weight over the soil. And so what's happening is you're gonna allow for the air to still circulate. The root system needs air just as much as the top of the plant needing air. So avoid um, walking around and compacting the soil. And if you have to get in a garden bed like this to do your deadheading or whatever, Consider uh, using a board so that you can equally distribute your weight and avoid the soil from being becoming compressed. So when to plant, don't be in a hurry. That's probably the most important thing on this slide. You wanna wait until your soil is workable, it's dry, 
technically your soil temperature, not your air temperature, but your soil temperature has to be at least 50 degrees. It's tough to tell sometimes if your soil temperature is 50 degrees. You can buy a soil thermometer. That's not a bad little tool to have. But um, don't rush. Um, typically, wait until the soil is workable. Usually after the last frost is a good time to consider planting uh, most of your things. What you can plant now are trees and shrubs. Um, perennials can probably be planted now. Um, you can also plant seeds now and pay attention to your seed packet. That will tell you a lot of information. For example, you'll see in this particular example, it'll tell you when to sow outside. Uh, so your seed packets will determine when to plant your seeds. Um, one thing to, to mention about a seed packet, since we're gonna talk about seeds now, is seeds technically don't expire. Uh, what happens is they may lose their germination viability over time. So you could test if your seeds are good to germinate by doing what's called a paper towel test. Take about 10 seeds, uh, put them a, dis a little even distance apart on a damp uh, paper towel, uh, roll up the paper towel, put it in a plastic bag, wait a few days and see how many of those seeds start to pop. And you, that'll give you an idea of how many seeds in that packet will, get a bit, will germinate. So uh, the percentage of what you see in the paper towel is a good indicator of the percentage that will actually germinate in, in the uh, packet itself. And when we talk about seeds, it's not too late for indoors. Here's some easy seeds to consider that you could go directly into the garden. Um, they're easy to grow and start from seed. Keep your seed packets. There's a lot of important information on them. There's basically three ways to plant your seeds. On the top left, for the smaller seeds such as lettuce, you can actually dig a trench and scatter them. And then you may have to thin them out once they begin to sprout. On the top right, you'll see the larger seeds can actually be placed in a line by just digging a small trench. Follow the spacing directions on the seed packet. And on vines, vining crops such as pumpkins or squash, take a look at the photo on the bottom left. If I hope it, it, you can see it, you can actually create a mound of soil, place your seeds on top of the mound. That way the vining crop can go down uh, from the mound. With, and that applies to things like zucchini or cucumbers or pumpkins or squash. Water carefully. When you first put your seeds in, you may be using a a watering can with a watering sprinkler head or a spray bottle because you don't want your seeds to wash away. Um, you can buy plants obviously to uh, plant directly. Um, your tags are the most important information that you can uh, have. Keep the tags. I always think it's important to do that. The smaller plants um, are usually better than larger ones and they're also less expensive. Look for plants, and if you're looking at flowers, that have more buds versus blooms so that you can have your blooms a longer time. And go to a reputable nursery where you can ask a lot of questions. Don't be afraid to ask a question. Also, an important uh, roots are important, and it's not um, unrealistic to go to a plant nursery and try to take the pot slightly out of its container, uh, take the plant out of the container, and take a look at the root ball. If you're too nervous to do that yourself, ask the nursery staff. You could see the difference on what a healthy root system should look like versus what an unhealthy root system should look like. They should be vibrant, white or yellow in color, and you should see lots of them. And if you ever uh, look at a pot or take a look at a pot uh, close up and you, you detect an odor, pass on that plant because that could be an indicator of root rot. And you'll know because it'll have a very distinct odor to it. 
Here's a little tutorial on planting. If you've never planted before, I think what I wanna want you to get out of this slide is you should always plant wider, not deeper. Plant at the same level the plant is in the container, but dig your hole twice as wide. Make sure you grab the plant by its crown, not the top of the leaves, so that that root ball can come out of the container. And don't be afraid to loosen the roots. Bare roots. Uh, this can be a little intimidating when, if you've never used these. They almost look like they're dead plants, but they're not. What they are is plants that are shipped in their dormant uh, stage. Because they're dormant, it's cheaper to ship, so they're less expensive to buy. They give you a lot more options in the garden. Uh, they just look a little funny when you first get them. You've probably seen bare root roses, but you can buy bare root fruits. Uh, the two pictures on your right hand side uh, show you bare root strawberries. So you can buy a lot of things bare root, uh, relatively inexpensive. There's just a little trick to planting them. It's a little bit different. When you get your bare root, you immediately want to hydrate it, as in step one, put it in a bucket of water, keep it in the bucket for one or two hours, you'll get those roots hydrated. And then what's different is the center photograph. You're literally gonna take that bare root, you're gonna create a mound of soil in the hole and you're going to place those roots over the mound. That's a little bit different than the example I showed you of uh, planting a container. And then make sure it's at the same level. You never want to plant deeper. Uh, you want to plant at the same level of the crown of the bare root. Planting trees and shrubs is very similar. I think the point I want to make with, if, you're, if you're planting a tree and shrub um, is if they come uh, in a root ball. If you look at photograph one, there's three basic ways that a tree and shrub can be purchased. We've taken a look at bare roots, we've taken a look at containers. You usually buy them in a root ball and sometimes they're either in wire or they're in uh, twine or they're in burlap. If you have wire or twine, you wanna make sure you remove all of it. If they're in burlap, then remove, you can remove about a third. Burlap is nice because it'll naturally degrade. Um, and you wanna make sure if you do buy a container tree or shrub, as in photograph two, a lot of times roots will wrap around a tree or a shrub. And you wanna make sure that you don't plant that until you've loosened that. You can even cut it. You won't harm the tree. You just wanna make sure you don't plant it or that girdling root will continue to wrap around that tree as it, as it matures and it could eventually kill it. And again, you wanna plant evenly with the uh, top of the, of the root ball. You don't wanna go deeper, you wanna go wider. Uh, a quick note on pruning. Uh, probably uh, just the, the point I wanna make, evergreens can be pruned at any time. Your deciduous uh, plants, that's, those are your trees that lose their leaves. Now is a good time to do thinning and trimming your dead branches. The trick with pruning is any plant that flowers. Probably as a general rule of thumb, you always want to prune a flowering shrub or tree right after it blooms. Because if you time uh, flowering pruning wrong, you're going to get all foliage and no flowers. Uh, our website has some great information on pruning uh, specimens such as lilacs or hydrangeas. So take a look at our uh, website to get some tips on pruning uh, flowering plants. Here's the correct way to make a pruning cut. You want to make sure it's at an angle. This is where sharp tools are critical. Just some quick design tips. Um, if you're starting from scratch, probably the big one is try not to buy every plant in the nursery. Curb your impulses. Start slow. Make sure you follow the spacing. Um, and take a look at making sure you've got something that's interesting for all season versus just one season. And some final thoughts on your design. Um, 
have fun. That's probably the key. Uh, that center photograph is an example of a, of a garden structure we did at the Parker Scripture Gardens, just recycling some material. Um, it makes it interesting, makes the space fun. Consider containers. Uh, that repetition concept is important. When you look at the picture on your left side, uh, they've just repeated the same plant, but it's made for a very interesting and dynamic design. So remember, repetition. Now, as we get to the end of the presentation, um, all good, you could do all the good things in the world. There's something that is bound to get wrong with your plants, but it's important to have the correct identification and it's very important to detect it early. Um, we're not going to get into a lot of details tonight, but I would invite you to my presentation next Wednesday where we're going to talk about pesticide use for the homeowner, but included in there will be some tips on how you can avoid a lot of these common issues on your plants simply by using some integrated pest management principles. And I'll also uh, give you some ideas of where you can go for help. Because when you're trying to beat insect and disease problems, it's all about building good soil. It's about knowing your bugs, because in reality, only 10% of all the bugs that are out there are bad. The, only, the other 90% are either beneficial or benign. So when you take a look at this tomato hornworm caterpillar, which is nasty for tomatoes, and it look, has what it looks like, these little rice kernels on top of it, those little rice kernels are actually pupae of a beneficial insect called the brachnid wasp. And they are literally destroying that caterpillar from the inside out. So if you happen to see a caterpillar that looks like that, in a day it's going to be dead. And so that's an example of knowing your bugs and trying to identify beneficials versus the bad guys. And there's a lot of natural controls like yellow sticky traps, um, and we'll talk about that more if you join me next Wednesday for the uh, pesticide class. I'll give you some other ideas on natural controls. Just remember to keep an eye on your garden and to keep maintaining it. Weed, uh, deadhead, remove uh, dead foliage, all of those types of things will reduce your chances of having an insect or a disease problem. So in summary, we, we talked about a lot tonight. We talked a, uh, about all of these topics. The one thing I didn't mention, which is a good idea now, is to start a garden journal. Especially if you're new to gardening, start taking some notes, uh, take pictures throughout the growing season, and probably most important is never to expect your garden to be perfect. Mother Nature isn't perfect and we shouldn't expect perfection either. It's an unrealistic goal, but there are a lot of things you can do. Hopefully you picked up on a couple tips tonight of things you could do to try to make your garden as perfect as it can be, because it's really all about the rewards that gardening gives you. It's a great activity to do with the kids. Um, it's, a, it's good for your body, soul, and mind. And I love it. And I'm hoping that I can convey that love to all of you so that you'll go out there um, and garden this year. And, and I wish you all the success in what you do. Um, and I, I, these are, are some Cornell um, resources of where you can go for help. Our website is a wealth of information, cceonida.com. Click on the home and garden section and there are a multitude of fact sheets, everything you need to know on whether you wanna grow vegetables, landscape plants, fruits. Um, and even if you just Google Cornell University home gardening, Cornell is just full of information um, and different places and different uh, websites you can go to go for help. These are just some of the credits and resources that I want to uh, do a shout out that help put this uh, presentation together.